Are you ready to explore exciting careers in neuroscience and neurotechnologies? Then join me, your podcast host, Dr. Milena Krastenskaya, or simply Dr. K, and my amazing guests on the Neuro Careers Doing the Impossible podcast. Discover what it takes to turn the impossible into reality. Tune in now to a thrilling episode number 49. Dear listeners, welcome to our new episode of the Neuro Careers Doing the Impossible podcast, where we explore careers in the cutting edge field of neuroscience and neurotechnologies and talk to the brilliant minds behind them. Today, we're excited to have Harrison Canning, a neurotechnologist, innovation strategist, and science communicator who is making waves with his media company, the BCI Guys. If you are into brain-computer interfacing, you might already know him from his work with this company and BlackRock Neurotech, where he serves as a neuroscience communication coordinator. Harrison is a firm believer in the power of neurotechnologies to expand human potential and liberate those affected by neurological disorders. But he is also committed to creating a brain-controlled future that is ethical, equitable, and culturally sensitive. In this episode, we pick his brain on the latest developments in brain-computer interfacing and learn some innovative strategies for aspiring neurotechnologists. But that's not all. We also delve into the importance of science communication in neuroscience and get some insider tips on how to get started in this exciting field. Whether you are a student, a researcher, or simply a neuroscience enthusiast, this episode is for you. So grab your headphones, tune in, and join us as we explore the exciting world of neurotechnologies with Harrison Canning on the NeuroCareers podcast, where we dare to do the impossible. Oh, welcome, Harrison. It's a great pleasure to have you today on our podcast. Thank you so much for coming. Can you please introduce yourself to our listeners? Although I'm sure many of our listeners already know you <laughs> from the work you do at BCI, guys. But it would be great to hear from you. And also let us know where you are joining us from today. And maybe some interesting facts about the place where you work. Well, thank you. It's an honor to be on the podcast. I have found it recently and it's been great listening to these episodes. I've gotten a lot of value uh, from that. So I hope that some of what I say today can be helpful. And uh, thank you for that wonderful intro as well. So you pretty much covered everything, but I'm Harrison. I'm located in Boston, Massachusetts, and I've been loving it here. I just moved here last year. There's so much neurotech stuff going on between all of the wonderful universities and hospitals that are in this area. So it's an exciting place uh, for neurotechnology. Right now, I'm doing two things. So as you mentioned, I have a media company called the BCI Guys, where BCI stands, of course, for Brain Computer Interface. And the goal of that is Colin, my business partner, and I want to create educational, entertaining, and easy to understand content about neurotechnology and brain computer interfacing with the hopes that we can inspire new people to get into the field and provide educational materials to make it easier for people to become accustomed to neurotechnology, to start talking about it, and so that we can work together to create a brain-controlled future that is equitable for everyone. Um, then in addition to that, I work at a company called BlackRock Neurotech. They're a maker of implantable neural interfaces, primarily for brain-computer interfaces, but lots of other applications as well. Um, and I'm the neuroscience communications coordinator there. And yeah, that's and that's also a really, really cool experience. And it's great to be able to take all of my interests of putting content out there and then apply that within that company as well. Um, and I should say, though, that I'm here um, just 
representing my own opinions today, um, not on behalf of BlackRock, but I can certainly share experiences of what it's like to work there. Thank you so much for your introduction and your kind words about our podcast. And I think there are definitely similarities between what you are doing and we are trying to do to inspire and you are inspiring people to learn and educate themselves about the neurotechnologies and we're inspiring people to educate themselves about possible careers in this field. So I'm sure we will have a wonderful conversation about two inspirational approaches here. Looking forward to it. What inspired you to pursue a career in neurotechnologies? Yeah, so it goes back quite a while for me. So in 2012, I saw a video from the BrainGate project where a woman uh, named Kathy Hutchinson, who was paralyzed from the neck down, was using an implantable brain computer interface, a, a Utah array, to control a neuroprosthetic arm to reach out and pick up a piece, uh, a, a bottle of coffee, bring it to her lips, and drink from it. And I was so inspired by by seeing that video and my mind opening up to the amazing possibilities of what brain computer interfacing can do. And also just seeing the huge smile on Kathy's face when she was doing that task, because that was the first time in 15 years that she was able to feed herself. And that was just such a touching moment for me. And the start of, and through the 2010s was such a wonderful time for brain computer interface innovation, where from there, there was more prosthetics work, there was vehicle control work, um, sensory restoration. And so all of these things were were happening while I was in high school and while I was thinking about my career in the future. And with each new innovation that came out, it just solidified in my mind that this was the field that I wanted to work in, that I wanted to contribute to helping people who have had um, neurological maladies, whether it's paralysis or something like epilepsy, helping them through these devices. And then in the future, brain computer interfaces, something that is accessible to anyone that can can benefit from them, whether with a medical need or, or otherwise. Thank you so much. And what background did you already have before you started getting into the field of neurotech? <laughs> Well, see, that's an interesting question, because when I first saw these videos, I was uh, 13. So <laughs> it's not like I had uh, much of a professional background. Um, and that was a little over over a decade ago. But before then, I will say I was interested in robotics. So I was interested in engineering. But and I think that's probably where I saw that that robotic arm. But really, my mind just exploded with these possibilities of just dreaming of, of the future of, of what that could look like. And so from that point on through high school, I just buckled down and was like, okay, I want to do everything that I can to learn about neurotechnology, watching videos, reading papers. And one of the things that I found was that it's it's really difficult. I mean, neurotechnology is, is daunting because it's not just neuroscience, it's engineering, it's a little bit of software engineering, and electrical engineering, and all of these things. And especially then, you know, 10 years ago, there really were not a lot of introductory materials for someone to get into. So, and that was partly what inspired me to create BCI Guys so many years later, is to provide a resource that I could have used and benefited from in the beginning. Yeah. And what path did you choose to get into the field? What education did you get to start working? Because as you said, you needed some engineering and some software knowledge and knowledge about neuroscience. Mm -hmm. So how... Did you find all those parts? Sure. I, I will mostly talk about college career and, and after, but where it really started for me was just searching online, trying to find any resources that I could to teach myself. Neuroscience and, and software engineering was really, really where I started because I was like, okay, these things I could could probably do from home. And at that time, a lot of online platforms that offer courses were really starting to pop up. So there was MIT OpenCourseWare, where they put a bunch of their lectures up for free. There was also a platform that exists today that has grown quite a bit, but it was just starting around that time called edX, where universities from around the world um, modify their courses and, and put them in an online format. And the vast majority of those courses are free. So I started there. And then when I was going into college, I knew that I wanted to study neural engineering. I wanted to work within this field, but especially six years ago, there really weren't any of those offerings that were available to undergrads. Maybe a few premier universities around the world, but 
very, very few and far between. That is changing, which is great to see. But at that point, I was like, okay, so how can I study this? And I found a program at the Rochester Institute of Technology in upstate New York that was called the School of Individualized Study. And they let me basically take whatever classes I wanted, get credit for doing my own study, which I had been used to doing through these online classes. And I could pair that with the University of Rochester to get like the neuroscience. So I got the engineering and neuroscience side of things. And that freedom was really, really important to me because as I found neurotechnology and working in that field is it's such a multidisciplinary field. And it's not just what I first thought the field was, which is very heavily engineering. And I found that as I was moving through this field and starting to work in the field, that I was interested in the other side of this as well, which is patient experience, talking about ethics, design, business, all of these things. And I found that neurotech is such a great thing in the middle of all of these different disciplines where I can apply so many different skills. And so in college, I wanted to do research, but there was no neurotech research going on at RIT. So I founded um, with Colin, who's the other BCI guy, I founded the Neurotechnology Exploration Team, which was a student-run research group, the first one at RIT, to build uh, assistive technologies using EMG and EEG technologies. Um, So we got a generous grant from the school, some lab space, and I really had no idea what I was doing in the beginning because I had only had the theoretical training, right? And I put together a proposal and I thought I knew exactly how it would go. And of course, it was very different than that, but it ended up being a wonderful organization that When I left RIT, I had a little over 90 people in it who were very passionate about this technology. And within that, I started, like I said, more on the engineering side, but I learned that my real passion was about inspiring others to work with this technology and teaching others um, that were in the, the research group about these technologies. And that spawned into BCI guys and just this goal of, of, bringing more people into the field and and making it easier for people to enter the field. Thank you so much for for sharing this experience. I'm so happy to hear that some of the universities, they offer possibilities basically to create your individual curriculum. Right. And this allows for new fields and new programs to emerge. What do you think from where you are now? after all this journey, what can you say about people who want to pursue a career in neurotechnology? What are the main skills that they should possess? And also, how did the field of education change over the course of these 10 years to support this need for people uh, to develop in the field of neurotechnologies? Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's such a wonderful question. And the answer is really quite expansive because I think that anyone that is interested in this technology, that is passionate about it, regardless of their background, can get into this technology and, and have an impact on that. And I mean that everything from the, the engineering side of things to designers that need to be making these interfaces to people that are doing patient care, like really anything across the board, you can get in industry and collaborate with others and contribute to this field. I think people primarily, when they think of what it means to be a neurotechnologist, are thinking of neural engineering, software engineering, neuroscience. And those are probably the most common paths, especially if you're going to go into academia and research. And I've been really excited to see that in the last 10 years, Lots and lots of programs that offer neural engineering, both at the graduate and undergraduate levels, have been popping up. And so you can find those just by searching neural engineering programs. And I have been surprised at how many there are. I made a video about a year ago, year and a half ago, for career recommendations for people in the field after they had gone through a course that we created called the Foundations of Neurotechnology. And I think I cataloged I want to say at least 130 universities that offered some form of neural engineering. So that was really, really exciting to see. And really all of that has popped up within, I would say, the last six years. So those are kind of the general disciplines, I think, that you could focus on. And there really are more and more resources popping up every day and more programs. So with a simple Google search, you can probably um, find a lot of those and get some good career pointers. Yeah, thank you so much. And I'm also glad to see all this growth of various programs. And now 
about your own work, your inspirational work to educate people. Can you tell our listeners how did you develop this BCI guys concept? Where did it all start and how did it all develop? Yes. So as I mentioned, in college, Colin and I started the Neurotechnology Exploration Team, which we shortened to NXT uh, Research Group to teach students about this technology, develop assistive technologies. And, and like I said, I found that my real passion was getting other people interested in the field, learning about the technology. And when COVID came around, of course, everyone remembers, everything shut down for a while. And I was not able to be in the lab working on the hardware, working with students. And you know, this is not really something you could do online because you needed to have access to expensive equipment. So Colin and I were thinking, okay, we still really want to be able to provide value to people. How can we do that? And I kind of went back to where I was in the beginning, finding online courses, online resources. And I was like, maybe we can create videos that can provide people those resources that we desperately wanted in the beginning to try to explain these very complex, these very overwhelming topics in a simple way that anybody can understand. And that gives people a good basis for wherever they want to go in the industry. And so that's where BCI Guys came from. And really, we've tried to stay true to our mission of just helping people get into the field, um, making it easier to talk about these technologies to foster that conversation. And so we created a course that's free called the Foundations of Neurotechnology, but we also create many topic videos where we'll try to dive into one complex topic and explain it as simply as we can, do some news reporting as well as some really fun projects like, for example, we control the RC car using EMG, um, video game controller using EEG brain sensing. So we have a lot of fun on the channel and uh, hopefully our viewers do too watching. Yes, absolutely. You create absolutely amazing videos. And how did you find the development of the courses, development of the videos? Because I suppose you were not that well familiar with the development of teaching material like this. So how did this all evolve for you? What were the main challenges that you found? And also, how did you overcome them? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a great question, because I really had no idea what I was getting myself into and, and how difficult it would be and how many new skills I would have to learn. And that has been kind of the story of my life with every one of these things. I, I get this vision and I jump into it and I kind of realize uh, in the beginning, I feel like I'm over my head and then you kind of figure it out. And the only way to figure it out is to dive in head first. And so, yeah, I mean, I, Colin and I had planned out the original course um, to be, we thought it would take us like, oh, a month and a half to do all of the research and the scripting. And then maybe we can record the videos over a week and then edit them in a month or whatever. And it ended up being at least an eight month process from when we started like really buckling down and doing the research with a team of another eight people. Um, we referenced hundreds of sources. I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, we wrote 200 pages of additional written content and learned video editing along the way. And I learned animation and some graphic design because I wanted to be able to show different diagrams and show it in a way that is a little bit easier to understand than a figure in a research paper, for example. And so, so many of these skills um, I had to pick up along the way. And I just kind of learned it out of necessity because I had an idea of what I wanted the end product to look like. Um, I wanted it to be sort of like a masterclass type thing or crash course, if anybody has seen those videos where it's more than just someone lecturing in front of slides, but actually incorporating little skits and animations. And so, yeah, we just learned those things on the fly and looking at our original videos and where we are now, I can see that that improvement and then just learning over time how to be better at science communication and explain things more simply for people these have just kind of developed over time and with no formal training, but just, you know, as I go through, you get better and better. And I'm sure that that's probably something that you can relate to as well with starting the podcast, right? And and making content. I think every content creator starts to realize that and that it's usually a little bit more than, than you think it will in the beginning, but it's so rewarding and worth every second of it. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And especially after uh, when you start receiving 
the feedback of how valuable this work is. There is that part when you don't know, I don't know if, if you experienced that, that you are putting out that content into the world, but you don't hear the feedback yet and you don't know is it working right. is it not you know what 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 am, <laughs> what am i doing did, did you experience this moment in in your development or oh my or gosh that? yes yes of course so i mentioned we we started with this course which was such a big undertaking it ended up being 21 videos and then as i said 200 additional uh, pages of content and it was just the only thing i was thinking about for those 8 months was the the research, what I wanted to say, how it would come across, all of these things. And as I'm getting through this, as we're going through the video editing, I'm like, is anybody going to care about this? Is it going to be useful for people? Um, and it's really scary putting those first pieces of content out there because you're like, was this worth it? Was the time and financial investment that I made into this uh, worth it? Will people find it valuable? And it has been so touching whenever we get we've gotten many emails or comments that are so supportive of people saying that oh i found your videos and now i'm interested in in doing a career in neurotechnology or i we went recently to open bci to do a video and a few of the interns came up to us and said uh, a couple of them said that they that our videos got them started and interested in neurotech. another one said that he watched through all of our course to prepare for the internship and when I go to conferences and people come up to me um, and mention that they like our, our content, it's just so touching and it, you know, it makes all of the effort that goes into it so worth it. So yeah, it's, it's a wonderful feeling and I appreciate everyone that has uh, provided those encouraging words. Yes, absolutely. And I'm one of those. So I really appreciate everything you do. <laughs> well, I echo that for sure. I'm very curious about the skills other than editing and creating a content, but actually you mm -hmm. mentioned that you had eight more people working with you on this project. So I assume that this was probably one of the first times where you had a team that you were working with, yes, and maybe working on supporting your idea yes that that you developed mm -hmm. so can you maybe share this experience how did you learn to communicate with the team what helped you to make sure that everything works that you are all on the same page and going in the way that you envisioned so how did this all go for you of course. Yeah, so so that is definitely true for that effort. Um, and then before that as well, when starting the re research group, um, that was also another another opportunity to to work on leadership skills and to operate in that environment. And I think in both cases, it's really important to have a, a larger vision that is well-defined and that everyone can share in. And so I think it's important to, at regular intervals, have a moment for everyone to come together, talk about what they're doing, what they want the project to be. And I think that that sense of shared ownership is really, really important so that everyone knows what they're, what they're contributing and believes in the overall mission. And so I think that, that that's always the start. And I think that that's really important. And then in addition to that, I've mentioned the multidisciplinary individualized degree that I was able to do. I very intentionally made a choice with that to try to dabble in as many different disciplines as I could to at least learn the lingo, to at least learn the ways that designers, for example, or software engineers think so that I could communicate with them and make sure that I am making reasonable asks, but also incorporating those different perspectives. And so I think that that was also helpful as well. And then, of course, just making sure that everything is trying to lay things out as, you know, as much in an organized manner as they can, um, but being flexible because everything changes all the time. And um, it's important to be able to communicate that to the team and, and just work with everyone um, through those difficulties, through those challenges. Yeah, thank you. And also what I noticed from your videos that you are communicating with different companies. Like you mentioned today, you were making a video with OpenBCI. So you needed to contact companies. You needed to get their okay for you to go and film. How did all that communication go for you? 
probably for them, it was also fairly new experience. Yes, mm -hmm. you know, they maybe didn't know what to expect at the beginning. So how did all this communication go um, for you? And what, what do you think made this communication successful? Yeah, so you're absolutely right that I think in the beginning, nobody really knew what to expect. And our industry, you know, neurotechnology is very small right now. And I think researchers and, and companies are still getting used to the idea of more eyeballs being brought onto their work. But I think everyone can understand the importance of that. And so we were lucky in most of those instances when working with BCI and BlackRock and GTEC um, and some others to have them approach us uh, asking to, to do a sponsored video or, or sending us hardware to do a collaboration in some way. And that was really exciting when we first got those emails because it was a, a feeling of legitimacy of, wow, people are paying attention and a sense that our voice matters within the field. And it was a learning process as, as we went through that too, of figuring out what is beneficial to them while at the same time making sure that we maintain an honest um, voice and are able to say what we want and not have our opinions compromised by that sponsorship or collaboration. And so that was really important. And we've also reached out to plenty of people as well. Uh, we did a video with Natalia Kosmina um, at MIT in the Media Lab, and we reached out because she was doing this wonderful project um, highlighting, uh, she made uh, models of neurotechnology devices that were seen in movies, which we thought was just such a wonderful way to communicate about neurotech, both the potential good and potential bad in the future. Um, and so we reached out. And in the beginning, it's definitely nerve wracking when we were first building this channel, because it's like, okay, here's, you know, here's the thing that we want to do. But I know we're like a little YouTube channel, but we want to do this big thing. And we're asking people for time or money in some cases. But what we found is that really just selling the vision of what we want to do, people can connect with that because especially in a small industry um, like ours, a small but growing industry, everyone here is so passionate about it and so excited that it's pretty easy to sit down and have a conversation with people and everyone supports that, that vision. Thank you. I'm so happy that neurotech industry, they're open to this type of projects. So my next question is about the challenges that come up in your work. It's not only sitting and recording like we're doing right now. Yes, we, we can do it through Zoom and other programs, but you are actually flying to the place, uh, flying with the equipment, and probably you are not alone. There is a team with you that is doing all the recording. How technically challenging is that? How much coordination does it take? And maybe you can remember some fun moments from these experiences <laughs> that happened. I'm sure you, you had quite, quite a few because it happens. Maybe you can share your experience about that. Yep. Of course. Yeah, I mean, it's it's always so fun when we get to do an on-site shoot, um, when we get to to travel somewhere, because it's just, it's wonderful to meet people in person and, and get hands-on access to a new technology or a project that people are working on. And it's certainly been a learning process. You're right. Now we definitely bring around uh, people with us. Uh, we have Michael, who is our, our video editor and videographer. And we need him because when we don't have him, we make mistakes with the camera. I mean, Colin and I have gotten decent at operating the camera, but there have been plenty of times where we have traveled um, out to somewhere and forgot to record audio on one of the streams or had the camera out of focus the whole time. And it's just, those are very painful learning experiences that are funny to look back on, but uh, it really shows that, you know, we, we need the experts to come along with us and we owe a lot in terms of video quality to to Mike um, for that. But yeah, it's it's always fun to be able to uh, go do video shoots and and really to get to know the either researchers or people at the company afterwards. Go out, grab drinks or or food. Um, yeah, the, the whole experience is wonderful. Yeah, thank you. And now I would like to transition to this topic of science communication in general, because as you mentioned that now you are working as a science communicator for BlackRock Neurotech. Yes. 
Why do you think science communication is important in neuroscience? And maybe you can describe in more detail what do you do in BlackRock Neurotech in terms of science communication? Sure, of course. I will start with the first question. Um, and of course, I'm biased because both with BCI guys and at BlackRock, I work within science communication. But I think it's very, very important. I think that it's something that everyone that's working in science, whether you're studying as a student, you have a lab, or you're working in industry, any type of science or technology, I think it is so important to spend the time um, to work on your skills for communication in general. Um, and I think that good science communication skills benefit society, they make science better, and they will help you in your career, again, regardless of who you are when you work in science. So for society, one example that I like to use of bad science communication is a few years ago, there was a study that came out that found that there was a chemical, I don't remember which one, but a chemical compound in red wine that is good for your heart. And I think that one of the conclusions that they drew was maybe if we can extract this, it can be a helpful treatment for X, Y, and Z things. But it wasn't very well communicated that that was the, the end goal. And what ended up happening was a bunch of news headlines ran with the idea that wine is good for your heart, all the way to the point where we had a headline that was saying that one glass of wine is as good as spending an hour at the gym. And so these things are kind of ridiculous, but they can also be quite destructive, depending on if we're talking about a larger issue like climate change, for example, and certainly within our fields. Uh, people are very concerned about devices that are reading their thoughts or where this could go in the future, spiraling out of control. And so it's very important for us to be accurate, um, but communicate in language that everyone can understand. And when you're doing that appropriately, you're engaging the larger society in the work that you are passionate about. You're inspiring future scientists You're getting more funding into the, the work that you're passionate about. So that's really important. And then between scientists, it's, of course, important as well, because it it will foster more communication. You'll get more citations if you've written a paper very well. And if you can communicate simply and well, maybe you will inspire someone in a different discipline, someone doing computer science research, to see a potential intersection between your work and theirs and some new innovation is born out of that. And then finally, of course, to the individual, I think that it is infinitely beneficial to try to develop a platform, to try to develop your voice as a thought leader in the field, which of course, again, can help you with funding, find other collaborators and utilize that audience that you are creating in the future to help mobilize them towards certain issues that you care about. So I think regardless of who you are, you have to remember that at every time that you're talking about your research, whether it's to a friend or in front of an audience on stage, that is all science communication. And it's important to think about how you want to be representing yourself. And so for me, of course, BCI Guys is always science communication work. We're always trying to break down topics, make it accessible for people, and bring more people into the field. And then as a result of that, I got the job over at, at BlackRock Neurotech that actually started because they reached out to us to do a sponsored video. And then working with them, it was a great fit because they really saw my need to work in a multidisciplinary nature. And so... My work there has been really multifaceted. So on, on the science communication side, I get to think about how materials that we are sending out to make sure that they are accessible for people, that they are communicating accurately and ethically about the things that we want to do and then for the field in general. I've also been really privileged to work a lot with patients. And this is my favorite type of work, doing patient advocacy and just sitting down with people that have had brain implants or maybe have ALS or a spinal cord injury that are interested and just hearing what they care about and what they need from this technology. And so I've given some presentations on stage with some of these, we call them the BCI pioneers, the people who've had these brain implants and just talking with them about their experiences. And, and that is just so important to me and the work that I do at BlackRock. And then in addition to that, I can use my multidisciplinary background to kind of sit between teams, which I also love. So I always know what's going on over at the engineering teams and the design teams, and I can sit between them and marketing and communications and, you know, help everybody collaborate together. Because I think sometimes there can be tension 
um, and I'm not saying specifically in BlackRock, but just in general, tension between the marketers need to sell products, right? And they want to have a simple message and the researchers don't want anything to be inaccurate or misconstrued. And, and that's important, right? Especially when you're talking about medical devices. And so I enjoy sitting in the middle and finding some common ground and figuring out ways to make our public communications understandable, but most importantly, very accurate. Thank you so much. And it's so interesting to see how your approach to things developed into this career path. Because as you were talking about uh, creating videos, you said that you were learning from different disciplines than the neurotech and uh, programming and design uh, and engineering to learn their language mm -hmm. that you use in your videos. And this provided you with the possibility to really connect all different areas within the neurotech together. And this is exactly what BlackRock Neurotech wanted to see. And now you can create this environment and support that multidisciplinary environment uh, because uh, you can understand the language of each of those groups, yes, and translate right. their languages <laughs> if, if needed, right. if there is some misunderstanding between people. So Absolutely. you are a polyglot uh, in, in, in a way, yes, <laughs> a person who knows many, many languages of neurotech, yes, and, and can also do a translation. So um, that's, I think, a beautiful example of developing your career path and then getting a job in the field based on that unique developed skills. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it, it has been both the work at BlackRock and then with BCI guys, such a wonderful fit for me because I'm just interested in, in too many things to focus on one specialization um, for a long time. And I think the downside of that is that, you know, in any of these, whether it's neuroscience or software engineering, like there are people that are much smarter than I am in, in each of those disciplines, but I can talk to them and bring them together. And it's so fascinating for me to be able to sit in the middle of that. And it's wonderful at BlackRock to be able to be in between those teams and, and working with these teams on developing new products. It's, it's such a cool position to be in. So, and it was a natural fit. And yeah, it's, it's really not a typical route, certainly, for someone to go in this direction and to be doing this type of work. But it has been a, a great fit for me. And really, that came from just working on my own projects and demonstrating a capability, but also the value of bringing multiple disciplines together um, and being able to make that, uh, that case for myself. Yeah. And I, this is exactly what I try to show in our podcast, that in neurotechnologies, everybody can find their own path based on their unique interests and unique abilities. So somebody can be really, really very narrowed, focused on something, on some approach, and they can become specialists in this particular field in neurotechnologies. Uh, maybe it's just developing sensors, developing electrodes for uh, sampling the signal within the brain. Uh, yes, or maybe creating mm -hmm. that electrode, a stent road. Right. But others may have this very broad view and interest in all different aspects, yes, which was the case with you, and it, you also found your unique path. Uh, there are artists that are doing installations and solving or viewing some philosophical problems through the prism of neurotechnologies. Exactly. So everybody can find themselves based on their uniqueness. Right. Yeah, that, that's what I always say. Because again, I think the perception is if someone's like, oh, I want to get into neurotech, the perception is, okay, great, be a neural engineer or work, work on the devices. But it really is so much broader than that. There is such a need to be talking about future legislation and ethics and big questions like, what, like, what does it mean to be human when integrating ourselves with these devices? And there is so much important work that can come from all of that. And like you said, and, and art as well. I think a really good example within science in general is NASA focuses a lot of energy on data 
visualization and making sure that people in the broader community, not just people that are in aerospace, are interested and passionate about the work that they're doing. And as a result, that creates more people that go into this field and it's just really, and more funding. And so it's really important. Yes, absolutely. Um, I also want to talk a little bit more about the science communication that you talked about. We see a big shift that is happening in science communication uh, because science for a long time was fairly separated from more broader reach. And we see some podcasts coming up and more videos and neuroscience, neurotechnologies, but also a tendency to simplify or maybe change a format of how the science is being presented. Even in a poster format, there is this approach to simplify the poster, uh, you know, having just main highlights, just very main points, main ideas, uh, writing articles, more and more journals are introducing highlights. Mm -hmm. And if we look at the publications, let's say, in Nature and Science, they are written in a fairly, I wouldn't say simple, but simpler way than uh, we usually find, you know, in, in many other journals. Sure. So, what change in science communication did you notice throughout this time that you were working in this area? Sure. That is a, a very adept observation because I've seen that as well. And I think that people are realizing that you can still convey the same amount of information without needing to use very fancy, complex terms. And I think that, you know, speaking for the neuroscience community in general, we've been guilty of over the years uh, just throwing out as many really long terms as, as we can, right? And a lot of times you'll see neuroscientists are defining their own terms that somebody else has defined as something differently. And it really becomes quite a skill to, to read dense like neuroscience and I would just say science in general writing to be able to parse through this. But really what we're finding, and I think the, the emphasis that these journals and then others that are talking about neuroscience and just science communication in general, is that that's not needed. And it's in fact not ideal to spend so much time, you know, reinventing all of these words and, and all of that. And so when we're creating videos and same with, with my work at BlackRock, I'm always trying to think of what do I want the audience to walk away from? And maybe I pull out three or four points and I try to always keep that central in my mind and everything else that isn't necessary in terms of like other complex terms, I try to remove that. Now, that depends on your audience, and you really want to know your audience, because if you are speaking to a scientifically literate audience, if you're speaking to people at a neuroscience conference, you're, of course, going to want to use industry terms. But really thinking about where will people get stuck and have to translate things in their head and trying to avoid that for the things that aren't really essential and really important. And then those things that are important, you just keep coming back to that, hammering that topic. And again, I mean, this makes science more inclusive for everyone, because even if you don't have this specialized training to be able to read certain papers, you can understand the, the main points of something. And I think that there is an ethical imperative to do this as well, especially in neurotech, especially in any science or technology that will be affecting the broad population. It's important to bring people in that aren't scientists and hear their perspectives and help them be well informed about this technology so that they can offer those opinions. Yeah, thank you so much. And with science communication, we are learning. Yes, we're in this phase when we are learning how to communicate effectively, how to really make this inclusive. Right. And there are some areas that definitely uh, need some adjustments um, because sometimes people who are not very well familiar how to do this communication, they can oversimplify things. Uh, but of course, everybody wants to do it, so but not everybody know how to do it in the best way. And yes. uh, people oversimplify and uh, make some conclusions <laughs> that yes. are really not based on the facts. You gave one of the examples, general, not in Neurotech specifically, but about the red wine. Mm -hmm. So 
there are many misconceptions about neuroscience and neurotechnologies because <laughs> of this slightly incorrect translation. Yes. Um, what are main misconceptions that you notice or maybe something that you hear from people about the neuroscience and maybe specifically about neurotechnologies? For sure. Yes. And there are so many. And that is a very good question because that is, I think, one of the most important things that we have to confront as science communicators is that balance of we want to, to simplify this, we want to make it understandable to as many people, but we want them to walk away with the correct ideas and be informed enough from our content that they are coming away with the correct ideas, coming away with what we wanted to, to teach them. And I noticed this a lot and definitely had some early frustrations when first getting into this to see, you know, when Neuralink first came on the scene, because of Elon Musk's name ID, lots of people who had never heard about neurotechnology were now interested in it, which I think is really wonderful. But I think some of the communications that resulted from that, whether from him or from just YouTubers or just any content creator that were excited, really leapt to conclusions that are far beyond where we are currently with the technology. And it would certainly be frustrating as someone who cares a lot about the accuracy of, of the content that we put out to see a video get five times as many views because the sensationalist thing that they've talked about is an easy thing to talk about, but is just not accurate. And so I can understand, especially with the pressures that science communicators will face to put out more content, where some of those foresights can happen. And so it's really important to find a way to make content that is accurate, but also simple enough that anybody can understand them. At this point, we've probably had thousands of comments or emails collectively where people are concerned that a device has been implanted in them maliciously and is reading your, their thoughts. People that have, you know, that are going through some sort of crisis, whether it's mental health or otherwise, that believe, you know, that someone else is controlling them or listening into their thoughts. And, and this is really tragic and, and painful to see because they are obviously in a very distressing scenario for themselves. And I know from, from being in this field that the things that they're talking about are not even close to possible and that they don't, don't in fact have these brain implants. But uh, and, that, and this I'm speaking on the very extreme, um, but obviously they have been misguided about about what it can do. We also get a lot of people that are that are quite angry because they don't believe that they have one of these devices, but they have heard certain ideas of what it can do. They're using probably what they've seen in popular culture and science fiction to think, oh, like this could be the matrix. Like people are trying to hack other people's brains and that is very concerning to people. And it should be. And I understand that, but it is also not where the science currently is. And so I think that it's important to have that ethical conversation, but within the context of where we are and what is possible and what is feasible. And I think the thing that is most difficult to hear for me is when patients, so these are people that could really benefit from this technology, whether it's for epilepsy, whether it's for mental health or spinal cord injury, ALS, that have been promised by these headlines, a technology that isn't quite here yet. And they believe that they can get it today. And they come to us and they say, you know, my son has Parkinson's disease, or my friend just had a spinal cord injury and can't move from the neck down. Can you please help me? And these technologies are, are getting there. And there are some really incredible things that they can do from uh, controlling prosthetics, computer control, vehicle control, and helping with mental health and, and epilepsy and Parkinson's. But it's just not widely available yet. And so to me, I think that it's really important to set expectations for patients and their families appropriately and say, yes, this is coming. Yes, you should have hope about this, but not overselling where this technology is today, because I think it's harmful both for patient expectations and then for people's concerns about what it is able to do. Yeah, thank you so much. And maybe you can provide some guidance to those people who might be listening to us and have certain misconceptions. Probably one of the major uh, the chips or, you know, electrodes can read our minds. What is true here and what is not? And also what might become possible in the future? And how can we counteract 
that by creating some ethical guidelines? That's a big question, especially that that last part. But uh, I'll start off simple, which is which is where we are today. Um, so where we are not is where even the best devices, you could not implant them and understand your private thoughts and be able to interpret that. We are not anywhere close to that today. And so I know that lots of people are, are concerned about that. That is still pretty far off into the future. The brain is so complex in the ways that we think. It will take a lot more understanding before we are even able to approach that subject because it is not just in one area. It's different from person to person. Um, you know, it really is a whole brain activity. So there's a lot more that needs to be learned to be able to do that. And I think for people, that is the most concerning future application is could somebody, a bad actor, be reading my mind, for example. Things that are done with the technologies today, the most advanced implantable ones are, I've mentioned this very briefly, but prosthetic control. So an arm that is connected to the area of the brain that would normally control your arm. So patients can, or users of these devices can just imagine moving their own arm. We can map that to the prosthetic and get a pretty high degree of control. Sending sensory feedback back to the brain to actually feel through those the fingers and that prosthetic to try to restore vision, to try to restore hearing. But these things are all very early stage, especially in vision. You might only get 100 pixels, um, which could be great to help you navigate and not walk into objects, but it's not like you're going to be reading or really recognizing people with that. And it's really only in black and white, so very, very early stages, again, just because of the complexity of the brain. These things are developing rapidly. There is computer control where someone can imagine moving a cursor on the screen and select that. These are all with implantable technologies, and that can allow people to type up to 90 characters per minute, which is amazing if you're someone that is not able to use a computer because you can't use your arms or possibly is unable to speak to be able to have communication to the outside world. These things are really important. And that's that's where we are today. And I will also say that the code of ethics within the United States, while there is always room for more, um, within the research community is is quite good, is quite careful, is quite conservative. And that's that's really important because there aren't people that have brain implants that we are unaware of right now. So people don't have to don't have to worry about about that. But I am glad that people bring up these concerns, um, regardless of where that information comes from. These are issues that we will have to confront in the future. As more of the brain is able to be recorded, it is possible that we could get to the point where you could, using a computer, um, access what someone is thinking about. And there are ways that that could be useful in terms of communication between people. Maybe we can communicate more fully. Instead of just communicating through words, I could send you an emotional feeling that I had, um, a, a visual memory, and that could be wonderful for bringing us together. But of course, that can be quite invasive as well. And so it's really important that we think about how that could be used. There are other technologies that are available today that are showing promising results for helping with cognitive enhancement. By stimulating the brain in certain areas, we may be able to learn faster, enhance memory. And so that will continue to develop um, to make it easier to do those tasks, which could be amazing on some level to help people learn more um, and apply that knowledge. But it could also become problematic for equitable reasons as the people that will be able to afford that technology uh, will have these cognitive advantages over people that don't, which will further widen that gap because they'll have more opportunities to them. These are very, very complex issues. And this is the time to be talking about it because um, even with those amazing applications that I've talked about, they really are quite crude and they are quite limited. There are only under 40 people that have had these implants for brain-computer interface devices. There are a lot more that are external, that are non-invasive, but they are quite crude in what they can do, just a few basic tasks. And so now is really the time to come together within the next five to 10 years to set those guidelines for what we want the future to be. How can we use these devices to make life better for everyone? And where are red lines where we say, no, I don't ever want the technology to cross this line to do this thing. And how can we prevent those misuses? Yeah, thank you so much. And how do you want to see the future of neurotechnologies, let's say 10, 20, you know, 50 years from now? Well, one of the things that is really important to me right now is 
sourcing community voices. And so I really like to try to be a representative of the industry in general, to try to be a representative of what the collective people want for, for these devices. And so I'm hoping in the future to continue the science communications work, but going in the direction of continuing to educate people and then just getting their thoughts so that we can put together a comprehensive legislative, also ethical framework to guide the development of these technologies. But for me personally, I will say that I'm most excited to see these technologies help in the medical realm, specifically for helping to cure neurological maladies. I mentioned epilepsy, Parkinson's, ALS. We can already see a future, the relatively near term, where these maladies could be completely gone, completely reversed. Maybe not necessarily cured, but we could use a device to overcome those challenges. And that is very clear that that will happen probably within, we'll say, 15 years, um, which is really, really exciting. I also think that using neuromodulation devices, so these are devices that will be stimulating the brain to try to repair something that is malfunctioning, using these devices for something like mental health disorders, whether it's depression or bipolar, schizophrenia, these things could have a huge impact on these disciplines. You might not need to use drugs anymore that have a very broad effect and may give you lots of side effects. You may be able to target that very specifically with neurotechnologies. And so I think that we could see a future where people are suffering a lot less from mental illness. So I think that that's wonderful. And then in the farther future, in terms of devices for, for everyone to use, I do think that there are lots of benefits in terms of making the workplace safer and making the workplace and just general life more productive for people and, and healthier. I think that the interfaces that we use today, a screen, a keyboard, a, a mouse, they're not very natural, right? This is not what we evolved to do. And I think that if neurotechnology is used correctly, we can try to make these experiences more human. Instead of interacting with data on a spreadsheet, we could interact with it in a multi-sensory way where we can feel, we can smell, we can just experience in those ways that are more natural to us. And I think that that would be a wonderful tool, especially on the science communication side of explaining complex topics to people. And I think that would be wonderful. But I am hesitant on some of these general applications for people with non-medical necessity in the future for these reasons that I said before. I think that it could create dependencies. Um, certainly, if it feels like if everyone feels that they need to have these devices to participate in the workforce, there was a great study that came out um, by Pew Research that showed that only 13% of people, I think they pulled 10,000 Americans, only 13% of Americans thought that widespread use of brain implants for cognitive enhancements would be beneficial to society. Only 13% thought that. But 60% believe that they actually I think it was more than that. I think it was somewhere around 80%, but it was very high percentage thought that in their lifetime, they would have to get one of these devices to compete in the workforce. These are people that don't think it's a positive, but feel that they might have to get it. And to me, that's a real problem. And then we also can talk about equity. The people that have access to these devices in the beginning will be more affluent and continue to increase their intelligence and then by function of that, have more opportunities presented to them. And so, yeah, I think that these are all important things to think about and to try to figure out how we want to tackle those today. Thank you for this vision of the future and also potential problems that we will need to tackle. Uh, what about your future plans? Uh, how, how do you <laughs> see yourself in the next maybe 10, 20 years? How do you plan developing your, your work? <laughs> well, I will say for the near term, just in case anyone at BlackRock is listening, I am enjoying that job and uh, I'm enjoying the flexibility. So I will continue <laughs> there for a little while. And certainly um, I'm loving the opportunities that come with the BCI guys work. So continuing to expand that in terms of BCI guys, that will, at least for the foreseeable future, uh, mean continuing with videos. But I could see that expanding towards educational programs, uh, museum exhibits, all sorts of different ideas that get to this goal of supporting people joining the field. I think for me in the long term, I've been increasingly interested in the questions involving societal impact of neurotechnologies and just the roadmap to development and thinking about the future. And like I've said before, incorporating more voices, whether that's patients, whether that's clinicians or people of the general public, getting their voices 
in this conversation about the technology so that we can put together the future that that we want for this. And so I see in the medium to long term, me transitioning my career into talking about regulation and ethics and thinking about those big questions about what does it actually mean to get these devices into the hands of people that I can help and how do we protect people. Thank you so much for sharing that. I uh, really liked you mentioning exhibitions. This is something I was thinking about uh, today after talking <laughs> to uh, another podcast guest, uh, Ruhl Herman. He's an artist and he was talking about his installation, which was absolutely amazing. And I thought, oh, you know, it would be so great to have an exhibition of various brain computer interfaces and uh, uh, those that are related to arts and other areas. So, uh, I, you know, this idea is alive and I'm sure it will manifest itself, yes. if, if, you know, uh, if it gets more and more and more yes. support. So that's amazing. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, I would love to have more ways for people to interact with certain neuroscience or neurotechnology topics. It's sort of that a an intermediary between that long-term goal that I was talking about, about being able to like walk around and interact with data. Well, how can we do that today in, in physical spaces? And I think there are lots of opportunities. And then just because you were talking about exhibits and museums, um, right now in Washington, D.C., BlackRock has a museum exhibit that features art created by the pioneers, by people that have had brain implants. And so they've just used like Microsoft Paint to, you know, drag the little cursor around and paint these these early uh, images, which are very cool. Um, one person, Nathan Copeland, has even sold some as NFTs. Another person... Uh, is a former designer, or no, sorry, he's still a designer, um, and he uses this brain computer interface to uh, manipulate Photoshop, and some of that art is on display. And again, this is what I love, is just seeing what patients can do with this, seeing patients benefit, and just the smile on their face when they get to do the those activities the, where they can show some of their creative side. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I saw this notification on LinkedIn about this exhibit and I was thinking I would love to be there and to see all of that. But uh, I I hope that this exhibition will become more common uh, and accessible uh, for, for many people to look at. I want to go a little bit back to what you were talking at the beginning, how innovations in neurotechnologies inspired you actually to pursue the career in this field when you saw a woman with a robotic hand, I think it was from University of Pittsburgh study probably. This inspired uh, so much, yes, basically the whole career path you chose. I'm very curious what current technological innovations inspire you now and inspire your work moving forward? Those first studies that were coming out, or at least the ones starting in, in 2012. So I think the one with Kathy Hutchinson was at Brown, but Pitt pioneered a lot of other ones that were also part of that early inspiration for me. I think when I first saw those videos, it was just so astounding to me what we were able to do. The fact that you could take these electric signals that are in our brain that are so complex and actually make sense of them and use that to control an external object. I mean, it was so exciting to me because it seemed like not just for medicine, but just the future of human computer interaction. I can see computers increasingly and our, just our technology getting increasingly closer to us and, and who we are. And I think the ultimate frontier for that is within our brains. If you could theoretically have an interface that could work very well with the brain, it could be the most natural interface that we have that just works the way that we think um, it is the fastest, the most immediate. Again, for another conversation, I think there are concerns there that we have to, to take as well, but I'll just stay focused on the inspiration side. And so when I was very young, I was like, okay, I want everyone to have access to this technology. Sometime in the future, I want to create this huge neurotechnology company that makes these devices available to all. And I had these big, grand ideas about what that would mean for everyone to have a neurotech device, for everyone to be interacting with each other just through thought. And, you know, when I was young at 13, I was like, this will solve everything. We will all be smarter. We will all be collaborating more. World peace, sure, everything. All roads lead to neurotechnology. And of course, that thinking has evolved from now where it's also important to see some of the, the other sides as well. But what inspires me today 
is just talking to the people that are currently using the technology and that will soon benefit from the technology. So talking to the pioneers, talking to Nathan Copeland, to Jan Sherman, to Ian Burkhart, all of these individuals that are using the technology and hearing how much it's meant to them to be able to do things independently again, to be able to even just send emails or communicate, to be able to, for Nathan Copeland, he loves to play video games. And so being able to play video games again uh, with his brain computer interface, these things bring them a lot of joy and a lot of hope for the future. And I'm thinking for them, like this could mean getting back into the workforce, being fully self-sufficient. And so that is just so inspiring to me. And I also think of examples like Stephen Hawking, um, who passed away from ALS. He had such an incredible mind, gave us so many amazing theories and amazing books. And towards the end of his life, he was writing these books that were hundreds of pages long, using an interface that could just do one to two characters a minute, not even words. And the dedication that he had, he would just sit there all day writing these things. And if we could have given him access to the technologies that we have today, and certainly the technologies of tomorrow, the possibilities would be endless. And so I'm very excited and inspired to see what patients are doing today and to think about the freedoms, the independence, and the hope that it will give them in the future. Thank you uh, very much. I, I absolutely share your your vision for for this future for for patients, and uh, I uh, I am also inspired watching the videos that you did with the pioneers, BCI pioneers, and I suggest all our viewers to uh, look look at those. Uh, our podcast is uh, career oriented. Can you maybe share some of your experiences of the biggest challenges that you faced in developing your career? Um, how did you overcome those challenges? What helped you to overcome them? Yeah, I mean, I think I'll sort of flip that question around and start with the thing that helped me was what we were just talking about the the inspiration and belief that these technologies will create a better tomorrow, that it will help people in all of the ways that we've just spoken about, and that it's possible. And just seeing those early videos of, you know, the robotic arms doing very simple things, but working nonetheless, being controlled by the brain, these things showed me that there is a future there. And that was really, really important because people don't know a whole lot about these technologies and what they can do. And so it was always something that I was confronted with. with people are like, you're doing what? Does that even work? Like, you're crazy. How are you going to find a job? How are you going to make a career with this? Like, like this seems like such a fringe thing. It seems weird. Like, uh, is this, like, why are you doing this, right? And And then also going into college too, the uncertainty with me being very determined to focus on this field and also there not being much of an industry to go into when I started it. And I believed very strongly that there would be and that gamble has worked well for me, but it was, I just needed to have that consistent belief because there were lots of opportunities for doubt um, being how small the industry is how, and and then just I, like my parents were always very supportive of me, but advisors and, and even, you know, advice from them in the beginning was just like, okay, like, you know, maybe spread out a little bit, do some other, you know, some other things just in case, um, because, you know, it, it was a very uncertain field and, and, you know, who knew where this would go, right? Um, and so I've, I've always found that to be a challenge but a way to overcome that is just to find communities and these communities are, are getting bigger that is one of my biggest passions is to help expand these communities help people find each other but there are all sorts of neurotech and neuroscience nerds that are out there you just have to know where to look and to find them and you know you can have some great conversations of what you think the future will be and then out of that will come connections and ideas and i think if as long as you're doing that your career path will uh, you will find it at some point. Yes, absolutely. And uh, you are uh, not alone. Um, I interviewed uh, Eva Esteban from OpenBCI and also Victoria Peterson. Uh, she was nominated her project for uh, the BCI Award mm -hmm. in 2021. And they both were saying that when they were mentioning what they're going to do, uh, people... Uh, really didn't understand them uh, and saying you're going to do what um, 
Right. So, so it's like crazy. Know. What do you, you want to hack people's brains, right? You get that a lot. And so, yeah. And uh, so good that you are mentioning that it's important to uh, join that community of like-minded people and also have the science communication going because the more people know about uh, the neurotechnologies, what uh, does it do, how it's possible to work in this field, uh, develop the career, the uh, more understanding we will have from the community and more support. And uh, I'm sure this is changing. Very quickly. And even those, um, our podcast guests, um, yes, they, they noted that now, of course, when they're saying this, it's an absolutely different approach to, right. uh, to, to that. So Thank you. Thank you for mentioning that and also contributing to that with uh, your science communication uh, that you right. are doing. Um, one question that I ask all of our podcast guests, because our uh, podcast is called Neuro Careers Doing the Impossible. Uh, what, <laughs> is, what is one thing that you thought of maybe being impossible that actually proved to be possible? And how do you think to, we can make the impossible possible? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Okay, so I would say... I will give a, a general answer and then a personal answer. Um, and so I would say the general answer is just that before finding out about neurotechnology, before seeing those early videos, I never would have imagined that you could even interpret brain signals in such a way where you could pull out you know, good enough information that you could actually control these systems. And so seeing that and learning about neuroscience was so eye-opening to me. These were things that I would have thought were impossible, but now so many pathways have, have opened up to me and, and to the field in general to see where this technology could go. I also have experience using a neurotechnology device that was very helpful to me. And the funny thing is, is, is this all came in after I had been interested in the field for a while. Um, but I used to have chronic migraines for years, for about six years. And I had tried many different medications and probably I think over like 30. And none of them would help. You know, maybe they'd help for a little while and then they would go away. And I ended up enrolling in a at-home TMS clinical trial. And I used that device. And in a few months, it had cut my headaches in half. By about a year, year and a half, my headaches were gone. And it was this was something I would deal with every single day. And so that was, in a very personal sense, eye-opening to me in terms of what this technology could do for people's quality of life for helping people with chronic pain, like I mentioned, mental health, any of these things, that was, if that, that, that just reaffirmed to me that this is the right field and that this is the right pace to, to really help people um, to have a huge, a huge positive impact on people's lives. And then in terms of the question of, of innovation, I always say that innovation um, comes from the intersection of, of different disciplines and when people from different backgrounds come together and share ideas. And so from that comes the science communication, being able to talk about your ideas and being willing to engage with people outside of your immediate circle, outside of people that are just in that field. And I think once people hear about these ideas and start to think about the type of work that we're all passionate about as, as neuroscientists, as neurotechnologists, that they'll have new ideas about how the technology can be used and applied. And from that, I mean, the possibilities are endless um, and beyond what any of us individually can think uh, for, for where this will go. So talk to other people, learn more about different disciplines, and innovation will spawn from all of those intersections. Thank you so much. And for those people who want to see your videos, to learn more about the work you do, uh, and maybe to get in touch with you, what would be the best way to do that? Uh, maybe you can tell us and we will also add all that information into our podcast notes. So you can just search BCI guys on YouTube. So that's BCI G-U-Y-S. Um, we are also at BCI guys on Twitter and Instagram. So that should be pretty easy to find. You can email us at the BCI guys uh, at gmail.com. Um, and then for me personally, you can just search my name on LinkedIn, um, Harrison Canning, last name is C-A-N-N-I-N-G. Um, or you can Google that and find my website and there's all sorts of contact information. And I love getting uh, messages from all of you, anyone that has questions, I will do my best to, to answer them and, and help out. So I encourage you to reach out. 
Thank you so much. And uh, before we end our podcast, um, maybe you uh, want to say something to our listeners, maybe uh, to have some advice um, that that you can uh, give or any message you want to share. <laughs> of course. Well, I think that your listeners are definitely in the right place if they want to do a career in neuro, because I see that listening to this podcast can give people a broad idea of different things that they might want to do. And that is such an important starting point and maybe even point to come back in your career and, and think about what you want to be doing. There are all sorts of resources online. There's certainly the things that BCI Guys has created, but there are many communities like I've talked about, NeurotechX's community, um, the OpenBCI Forum. There are all sorts of events like GTEC Spring School that's coming up. BCI Society meetings, conferences, all of this stuff. And so I encourage you to, to dive into that. The other thing I think is once you find out what you're interested in or as you're exploring that, do your best to just jump in and do it. And there may not have been someone that's done it before. It may not be a very clear path, but I think that will become relevant to you. I've had a lot of people in undergrad reach out to me that are in neuroscience and they say, I am a neuroscience major, maybe even in graduate school. I'm a neuroscience uh, graduate, but I don't want to do academia or industry work like in just neuroscience research. What else can I do? And I think what I've been focusing on in my career shows that you can really find a path through anything and just find the value in the intersection between the types of work that you want to do. If you're interested in business and neuroscience, well, everyone in business has a brain. Figure out a way to apply neuroscience principles to business. Write a paper about it. Make a video, a piece of content. Just demonstrate that you have that knowledge and capability. And if you can do that well, people will see the value and you'll be able to pitch yourself and work within that area. Yes, absolutely. I absolutely support this message. Thank you very much for sharing. And thank you so much for being such a wonderful, uh, our Neuro Careers podcast guest. <laughs> I appreciate um, all the insights. Uh, and I'm sure our listeners also will appreciate uh, this conversation very, very much. I wish you all possible success in all your uh, new beginnings and continuation of what you are doing. And I hope to see you maybe in a couple of years and uh, to hear the updates that you uh, 